Well, good morning, Honey Ridge family. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be able to bring you the message this morning. It's the third day after the crucifixion of Jesus. Jerusalem is abuzz with news of the events which had unfolded and which had seen Jesus being put to death in a most violent and inhumane way. People were trying to make sense of it all. Wasn't Jesus going to free the Jews from the shackles of Rome? And what about the unnatural events that had taken place just the few days before? The earth falling into complete darkness for three hours in the middle of the day. The curtain in the temple mysteriously being torn in two as if by a mighty unseen hand it had been taken and ripped from top to bottom. Tombs breaking open and bodies of people who had died being raised to life. How could anyone make sense of it all? But let's zoom in closer to two men walking along a road. The scene is at first glance a very ordinary scene. Two people walking along a road and talking to each other about these recent events. While they were doing so, a stranger joins them and joins their conversation and the three talk together. As the conversation begins to unfold, we begin to see that this conversation is anything but ordinary. For the two travelers, a trip that had started off under a cloud of heaviness became a journey that was life-changing. The two travelers began the day and the journey sad and dejected. They ended the day and the journey burning with zeal and excitement. The story we're going to look at this morning is the account of the two travelers on the road to Emmaus, which we find at Luke 24 verses 13 to 35. Now interestingly, this account is only found in the Gospel of Luke. None of the other Gospel writers mention it. Yet Luke devotes a whole 22 verses to the seemingly unimportant event. Why is that so? Well, I believe, as we will see, that the lessons that are learned in this story are as relevant and as profound to us today as they were to the two obscure travelers. There's also intrigue in the story. At first, the travelers didn't recognize who their companion was. It's only much later in the story that his identity is made clear to them. But we, the reader, are drawn into the intrigue because we know more than the participants themselves concerning the identity of their mysterious companion. Part of the drama is when and how the two travelers will realize who their discussion partner is. So won't you turn with me to Luke 24 from verse 13 as we read this account together. I'm going to be reading from the ESV. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is the conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and before all people and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel yes and besides all of this it is now the third day since these things happened moreover some women of our company amazed us they were at the tomb early in the morning and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was, he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, 
O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Now as we look closer at this passage, I'd like to do so under four main headings. Then I'd like to apply some points to our lives today. The four headings that I'd like us to look at in the story is firstly the geographic journey which we find in verses 13 to 16. Then secondly the gradual revelation from verses 17 to 27. Then the glorious fulfillment in the meal from verses 28 to 32. And finally the glad return from verses 33 to 35. The geographic journey. Now the first thing to note about this journey is its distance. We are told that the road from Jerusalem, which is where they were coming from, to Emmaus, which is where they were traveling to, was about seven miles or the equivalent of about 11 kilometers in distance. It would have taken them probably three to four hours to cover that distance. The journey was Jerusalem to Emmaus. The travelers had probably traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover meal, which had taken place the previous week, which we read of in Luke chapter 22, verse 1. They had witnessed the events that had culminated in the crucifixion and the death of Jesus, and now they were returning home to Emmaus. Yet historically, the location of Emmaus has never been decisively pinned down. And so here, the destination is not as important as what happened on the journey to it. The next thing that I'd like you to note is that the, true, is that the two travelers are not initially identified. In fact, only one of them is identified as Cleopas in verse 18. The other traveler remains nameless throughout the story and to this day. And so we can only speculate who he or she was. And so, their uniqueness lies in the fact that they were not unique. They remain mainly unidentified, and we know very little about them. Yet, in a narrative lasting 22 verses, Jesus spends the better part of an entire day with these two unknown individuals on the day that he was resurrected. We can also deduce that these two were followers of Christ. We know this from the topic of their discussions, which was the death and burial of Jesus in Jerusalem just a few days before. The two travelers were engaged in an intense discussion. Which leads us on to our final observation about this journey, and that is that there was a spirit of heaviness and sadness which hung over them as they walked and talked. In fact, verse 18 tells us that they were sad. It had been an unusual few days, and they were reviewing what had transpired. The death of Jesus was the biggest talking point of that time, and they were trying to digest and understand everything that they had witnessed. Yet even though they were sad, they did not stop talking about the Lord. Now, I want to just pause here for a moment and make a side point, and that is the importance of flavoring our conversation with Christ. Listen to what J.C. Ryle said over 150 years ago on this particular subject. 
He wrote, If we believe we are journeying to a heaven where Christ will be the central object of every mind, let us begin to learn the manners of heaven while we are yet on earth. So doing, we shall often have one with us whom our eyes will not see, but who will make our hearts burn within us by blessing the conversation. And then Malachi 3 verse 16 says this, Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. Just the importance of flavoring our conversation with Christ, even in difficult times and difficult circumstances. But now back to our story. While the travelers are in, are in intense discussion with each other, Jesus joins them on the road. We don't know whether they did not recognize him because they were sad, or whether it was because they knew that he was dead and therefore they did not expect to see him. Whatever the case, Jesus had a form of resurrection body that they did not recognize until he chose to reveal himself to them. Secondly, the gradual revelation. In verse 17, we read that Jesus joins their conversation and asks them what they were talking about. Now, obviously, Jesus is not asking the question because he did not know the answer. Jesus is all-knowing. He did it rather to draw them out. He wanted them to tell him what was on their hearts. The reaction to the question posed by Jesus is quite simple. They were astonished. They stopped walking and looked almost disbelievingly at Jesus at what he was asking them. Their reaction was like the reaction any one of us would have if a stranger came into our midst and asked us why everyone was walking around wearing face masks. Are you kidding, we would say? Where have you been these last few months when the whole world has been dealing with the scourge of the coronavirus pandemic? And so, one of the travelers who is now identified as Cleopas asks Jesus if he is the only person in Jerusalem who did not know the things that had happened in the last couple of days. They cannot believe that anyone coming out of Jerusalem does not know what had happened. They are shocked at his ignorance. But Jesus asks another question. What things? Again, this question was meant to draw them out further. Now the answer given by the men to Jesus reveals something of their hearts and their expectations as they and many others like them had of Jesus. Let's consider their response a bit more carefully. Firstly, let's consider their misunderstanding of who Jesus was. They described Jesus as a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. Now to describe Jesus in this manner by calling him a prophet, even a prophet like Moses, is less than a full description of him. They did not see Jesus as the Son of God. They did not understand the message which Jesus had been preaching to his disciples for the three years of his ministry, which was that the Son of God, who came to earth as a servant, had to die at the hands of men so that mankind could be redeemed forever from the scourge of sin and could forever be reconciled with God. But there was also disappointment in their answer. Despite his impressive ministry, Jesus was rejected by the Jewish religious leaders when the travelers identified as our chief priests and leaders who had handed him over to be condemned to death. The blame for Jesus' death is placed at the door of the Jewish leaders and while they had a large part to play in the crucifixion, the travelers did, just did not see that it was by God's design and plan that it should be that way. Secondly, let's look at their misunderstanding of Jesus' purpose. The two travelers were downcast because they had hoped that Jesus was going to redeem Israel. They would have been aware of passages in the scriptures and particularly Isaiah who prophesied in Isaiah 44 verse 22 when he said the following 
I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. You see, for these two men, what they had hoped for, like most Jews of the time, was a political redemption of the Jews by a conqueror, not a spiritual redemption by a sacrificial death. They looked for redemption like that of their forefathers out of Egypt. And now they were disappointed because their redeemer had been crucified. It was as if all of their expectations had not been met and they were left disappointed at the fact that Jesus was just not who they thought he was. Thirdly, let's examine their lack of faith about the resurrection. An element of doubt ends the summary by the Emmaus travelers. They recalled that the woman and the disciples who went to the tomb on the third day found that it was empty. It was as if the decisive piece of empirical evidence was lacking, an appearance by Jesus himself. Now you see in this, they are no different to modern day skeptics. Only the presence of the raised Jesus would convince them of what actually had happened. The very irony of this all, as we the readers of the passage already know, is that they were in the very midst of the one who they could not believe had been resurrected and was walking with them and they didn't even know it. Now at this point I can imagine Jesus sighing deeply as he listened to the two. He must have shaken his head in disappointment at their clear lack of understanding. And so he responds with a rebuke. O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. You see the rebuke which when translated literally means someone who is lacking in thought and understanding expressed great disappointment and was not unlike the rebuke given by the angel to the woman at the tomb which we read of in Luke 24 verse 5. When the angel said to the woman, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? You see, the reprimand was there because the two had only believed some of what the Old, of the Old Testament prophets had said. The Lord reprimanded them for not believing the whole of the Bible's teaching. They had read about the Messiah in the scriptures, but they had only concentrated on the prophecies which told of the Messiah's coming in all his glory to set up his kingdom. They had ignored the portions which spoke of his suffering and his death. And then we see the Lord's great love and patience demonstrated to these bewildered, confused and weary travelers. Let's remind ourselves again that these two were not part of Jesus in a circle. They were largely unknown and the one remained nameless throughout the story. And yet, these two were the entire congregation of what has been called the greatest Old Testament exposition in all of history. Verse 27 says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now note that it wasn't just some of the scriptures which Jesus explained. Rather, he went through the entire scripture front to back. His teaching would have been comprehensive. Just imagine having a private audience with Jesus and having him interpret what all the scriptures had said about him. Grasp how two obscure people were the recipients of the greatest sermon of all time. And so Jesus begins opening eyes that had previously been closed as the rebuke sets up the revelation. He has not yet revealed himself, but he is preparing them for the truth of his self-revelation. Now I need to say that some people find it difficult to read the Old Testament. In fact, for many, the Old Testament is mostly just a historical tale of stories and events that have little or nothing to do about Christ. They fail to see how the Old Testament in every respect points towards Christ. Jesus himself confirmed the fact that he is in the Old Testament. In John 5 verse 46, 
He explained to some religious leaders who had challenged him on the fact that the Old Testament was talking about him. In answer, he said to them, If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Listen to the words of J.C. Ryle on the subject as he summarizes things so clearly. Christ was the substance of every Old Testament sacrifice ordained in the law of Moses. Christ was the true deliverer and king of whom, of whom all the judges and deliverers in history were types. Christ was the coming prophet greater than Moses whose glorious advent filled the pages of the prophets. Christ was the true seed of the woman who was to bruise the serpent's head, the true seed in whom all nations were to be blessed, the true Shiloh to whom all the peoples were to be gathered, the true scapegoat, the brazen serpent, the true lamb to which every daily sacrifice pointed, the true high priest of whom every descendant of Aaron was a figure. Now we are not told of the traveler's reaction to what Jesus had said to them on the road that day. But it must have been a spectacular reaction. Later on, in verse 32, we read that after Jesus had left their presence, they affirmed to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Thirdly, let's focus on the glorious fulfillment in the meal. You see, by now the travelers had arrived at their destination and it was getting dark. Jesus makes as if, he be, as if he'll be traveling further, but the two ask him to come in and stay with them for the night. The Bible tells us that they urged him strongly. They offered him a meal. Perhaps they wanted Jesus to share further with them about what he had been sharing with them on the road earlier in the day. But whatever the reason, Jesus accepted their invitation. But amazingly, although they had offered him hospitality, Jesus became their host. They immediately prepared the evening meal. It was a simple meal, just bread and something to drink. The travelers still did not know who Jesus was as he reclined at the table with them to share in a fellowship meal with them. As the bread is passed around in a most natural way, Jesus took it, gave thanks for it, broke it and gave it to them. Now I need to pause here for a moment and say something about what other commentators have said concerning this meal. Some of them have likened the meal to a communion meal, which is what caused the men to recognize who Jesus was. But if we look at the passage carefully, we read too much into it if we ascribe to it communion. This is so because firstly, the two travelers were not present in the upper room for the Last Supper on the night before Jesus' betrayal. So they would not have recognized anything in Jesus' manner of breaking the bread to remind them that this was the Lord. Secondly, there are no words of consecration used for the bread and the wine, which we read of in 1 Corinthians 11. And thirdly, Jesus vanished from their sight before the meal was completed and before the wine was served. Exactly what it was that caused their blind eyes to see, their disregard to turn to recognition, their ignorance to turn to understanding, we just don't know. Could it have been some familiar and well-known gesture of his in breaking the bread? Maybe it was a familiar demeanor which they had witnessed when he fed the 5,000 people. Perhaps it was even the nail prints on his hands which they saw for the first time as he was handing around the bread. Whatever it was, they recognized Jesus and then he vanished from their sight. Now I'm sure there's been times in your life when you've had an aha moment. A series of unconnected events suddenly makes perfect sense. A string of disconnected facts suddenly connects in a most remarkable way. The fog across the landscape suddenly lifts and the picture which emerges is brilliantly clear. Well that's what happened here. These two disciples had an aha moment. And so it was that their whole demeanor and outlook changed instantaneously they immediately recognized the significance of what Jesus had been sharing with them on the road only a few hours earlier and their reaction was to recognize that their hearts had burned within them as Jesus had opened the scriptures and shared it with them and so our final point on this passage is the glad return 
our two characters were so excited that they immediately packed up their goods and they did the 11 kilometer return journey back to Jerusalem. At night, when it was dark and dangerous to be outside, without the benefit of any light on a treacherous and dangerous road, after a full day's journey, which they had already made hours before, 22 kilometers in one day, on the outward journey, they were sad and dejected. On the inward journey, they were eager and excited. The two disciples are anxious to pass on the news of what they had discovered to the other disciples. The disappointment that the disciples had not seen Jesus had been reversed by Jesus himself. When they reached Jerusalem, they found the 11 disciples together with some other people. Before they could say anything, they were told with great excitement that the Lord had risen and had appeared to Simon or Peter. There was so much joy in the place as everyone was bursting to tell each other the good news of what they had witnessed. Not only did Jesus provide evidence of his resurrection on the road to Emmaus, but he did so in Jerusalem too. Now as we step back from considering the details of this passage, we need to ask ourselves, what has this account to say to us in our current circumstances in 2020? You see, I think it's significant that the events which the two travelers were speaking about on the road was the recent events which must have dominated the news and everyone's attention at the time. Indeed, Cleopas responded to Jesus in amazement when he asked him what events they were speaking about. Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? We too find ourselves in a most unique time. In fact, an unprecedented time where we are trying to figure out what's going on around us, trying to make sense of all that we have to endure. We would be amazed if someone were to come among us and asked us why everyone was walking around wearing face masks. You see, it may be the pandemic which has rocked your world. You may be feeling the devastating effects of the, of the pandemic on your employment, on your finances, or on your future. It may also have nothing to do with the pandemic, but rather the challenges, hurts, fragmented relationships, or the problems which were, which were there even before the pandemic started. And so the first point of application is for us to recognize that the two travelers had fixed their minds on the problems around them and not on Christ. This is unfortunately all too much like human nature. We can have the intellectual knowledge of who Christ is and what he has promised us in his word. But when circumstances start to crowd in and overwhelm us, we quickly turn our focus off Christ, forget about him and place our focus on the problems which we are surrounded with. It's said that if you hold a coin close enough to your eye, you can blot out even the whole sun. But Hebrews 12 verse 2 calls on us to run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. The second point of application is that it's possible to be very familiar with the things about Jesus, just as the two travelers were, and yet not have a personal knowledge of and relationship with Jesus. It's possible to be familiar with religious things, yet not have a personal relationship with Christ. We can have an intellectual understanding of who God is, yet not enjoy a daily, intimate relationship with him. It's also very interesting to note, just as an aside, that when their hearts burned within them, it wasn't because they had recognized Jesus physically, but rather because they had come to understand who Jesus was from the scriptures as had been revealed to them. This is the same regeneration work of the Holy Spirit which we all need to experience as we come to see Christ from his word and we come to understand about Christ from his word. So where do you stand on this? Ask yourself, do you know about Christ or do you know the Christ? If you cannot be sure whether you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, how I pray that even today you would bow your knee to him, confess your sins to him, and invite him to be Lord of your life. 
The third point of application of the story is that the two disciples had their own view of what they wanted Jesus to achieve for them. They were following their own agenda, not God's agenda. You will recall the words spoken by the two men when with almost disappointment they told Jesus that they had hoped that he was going to be the one who would redeem Israel. That was their agenda. In looking for a conqueror, they had failed to see a servant king. You may have many questions in your mind right now about what you're going through at the moment. You may have been struggling for a long time with issues which just seem to be ever presently before you. You may have even pleaded, just like the psalmist had pleaded, How long, Lord? How long will you forget me forever? Will you hide your face from me? O oh, brothers and sisters, we cannot know fully what God is intending to teach us during this difficult time. But what a pity it would be if we didn't place ourselves in a position to learn everything that God has intended to teach us, all the valuable lessons that he has in store for us. To be able to look at our situation and surroundings, not through our own eyes, but rather through the eyes of Christ. The fourth point of application is that once they recognized and understood who Jesus really was, they could not keep this to themselves. They had to share it with others. Their behavior was almost irrational. It burned with excitement and zeal. They immediately returned to Jerusalem to tell the other disciples of what they had witnessed. Do you have such an excitement about wanting to share Christ and the gospel with other people? Is this a desire which spurs you into action? As you drive to work in the mornings, are you thinking about opportunities where you could witness to your fellow workers? As you're sitting in the classroom, are you thinking about how you can share Jesus with your friends? Is this something which is on the forefront of your mind? Oh, how I pray that we would all be so much more acutely aware of the opportunities which Christ puts before us to spread his word and that we would do so with zeal and with excitement. And so the final point of application is really obvious and self-evident, but we need to be reminded of it. And that is that Jesus was with the two travelers on the road, in their midst, and yet they did not see it. When circumstances become overwhelming, or when the situation gets too much, it's easy to forget that Jesus walks with us, next to us, and goes ahead of us. In Hebrews 13 verse 5, we read that God has promised that never will he leave us and never will he forsake us. Psalm 121 assures us that he will not allow your foot to slip, your protector will not slumber. Indeed, the protector of Israel does not slumber or sleep. The Lord protects you. The Lord is a shelter right by your side. The sun will not strike you by day or the moon by night. And so, beloved, even in this unique time of the COVID-19 pandemic and all its effects, Jesus is in our midst. He walks alongside us, ahead of us, guiding us, comforting us, encouraging us, and waiting to reveal himself to us. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, thank you for the promise never to leave us or forsake us. Thank you that you're always there even when our disbelieving self thinks otherwise. Help us to look at our situations not through our own eyes, but rather through the eyes of Christ. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone who's listening to this message this morning who knows about you but does not know you personally, I pray that even today by your Holy Spirit you would reveal yourself majestically to them just as you revealed yourself to the weary and confused travelers on the road. Thank you for the privilege of hearing your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you to Cliff for so faithfully just expounding God's word to, to us today and for the, the wonderful encouragement that God's word has been to us to know that we are so privileged to always have Jesus with us. What a, what a blessing. And so if your heart has been warm today as those two disciples on, on the road to Emmaus, as their hearts were warmed, as the scriptures were opened up to them, 
What are you going to do about it? Who are you going to share this exciting discovery that you have received this morning about the Lord Jesus Christ, about his, his ever presence with us in the journey of life? Who are you going to, to get up and, and run to tell about the wonder of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ? And so we're going to close our time of worship this morning with a wonderful rendition of a song called, There Was Jesus. And if you don't know it well enough to, to sing along, then just use this time to, to really worship the Lord quietly as you focus on the words and as you consider the journey of life that you have been on up to this point and how the Lord Jesus Christ has been with you every step of the way, faithfully supporting you, encouraging you, leading you, providing for you, protecting you, uh, that we would be able to really worship the Lord Jesus with the singing of this closing hymn. And I trust that as you continue into this week ahead, that you will know in a very special way God's daily presence with you. The Lord of armies is with us. He is our stronghold. And that you will find great encouragement in the Lord uh, as you go about whatever the Lord has planned in advance for you to walk in this week. May the Lord bless you. Amen.